Today's guest, people, is very special in that he had a bird's eye view of the growth of hip hop culture as he was born and raised in the Boogie Down Bronx, also known as the birthplace of hip hop. Now, his first record, Funky Technician, came out in 1989 on the seminal hip hop independent label Wild Pitch Records. His second album, Return of the Funky Man, dropped in 92 on Giant Records. And his third LP, The Awakening, which is actually one of my favorite hip hop records of all time, came out on Penalty Records in 1996. Now since then, this cat launched Funky Man Productions, producing hits for cats like Biggie Smalls, SWV, Fat Joe, Karen Wheeler, not to mention his late protege, Big L, who has a record coming out later this summer. Now, in between working on new music projects and whatnot, this cat is uptown in the trenches coaching a team up in Rutgers. And today, we got him up in here talking about violence and hip hop. Welcome for me, if you will, the omnipotent Lord Finesse. This is One Nation, and I'm your host, Tracy McGregor. I know um, we talked a little bit about what today's uh, show is about, uh, violence and hip hop. I know that you were raised in the South Bronx, a neighborhood that at one point was notorious for drugs and crimes and violence. What are some of you still? I mean, some of my earliest memories is like trying to stay out long enough to watch Flash set his equipment up uh, and watch him jam. You know, I got to see the cold crush around my way couple of things I got to see, you know, but I had to basically beg my grandma, oh, Flash is setting up, just let me stay out till 11, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. See, but you're, you know, it's interesting because when you think about the South Bronx, you think of like all of those negative things that go on within the neighborhood. There's a lot of positive things that yeah, seem to be I mean, going on as well. A of, it's a lot of positives. I mean, when I was growing up, I was just blessed to have a community center that was open. So mm -hmm. like swayed me away from a lot of negative things like mm -hmm. drugs mm -hmm. and peer pressure. And you know, it's I had a lot of programs, different programs that my grandmother put me in. So I wouldn't be caught up within that 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 project life. When I was when I was hanging out, it wasn't no such thing as going to the corner and drinking forties. <laughs> that wasn't it back in the days. I mean, maybe shooting dice and gambling was real heavy. But as far as it getting drunk, getting high thing, yeah, you know, they had the, the five dollar bag of weed and mm -hmm, all that, but it wasn't mm -hmm, like the mm -hmm, chronic mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it wasn't like it wasn't fully developed how it is right now. So I missed a lot of what's going on right now because it was like back way, way back when when I was growing up, I'm not saying way back, like I'm forty, but <laughs> When I was growing up, it was also a lot of a lot of community relations. So mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. if you ain't even have to be my mother, you was my mother friend, and my mother gave you permission if you caught me doing something bad with my ass, you know. So I ain't only have to look out for my grandmother, but I had to look out for you, look out for my homeboy moms. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. like that. It was like, oh, little Jonathan, come in, <laughs> just look and tell your moms. Yeah, I had to slap little Jonathan up because. He was out here wilding, you know? Right. And, and right, it wasn't like right. you hit my child, it was like, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna bust his ass when he get upstairs, mm -hmm. you know? It mm -hmm. was like it was like a double ass whooping thing going on. <laughs> <back then. laughs> you know? Or the it takes a village now theory. It's like, <laughs> now it's like it's more it's more it's very street now. Yeah. Kids do basically what they want, you know? Just 
just a little over a year ago, you lost a close friend and actually your protege to street violence. Um, talk to me a little bit about your friendship with the late Big L, and if you would recall for us the first time you met him and, and some memories that you have of Lamont. Well, with L, <laughs> I mean, wow. I mean, I have so many, so many, so many memories of being around Al because, you know, he's one of the closest to me. Uh, probably out the whole digging besides show and besides AG and Buck Wow, L is just was always called to check up on me. Yo, what's up? I'm going here. I'm throwing a party here. One thing I could always say about L, L was always outgoing. He was everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, he was everywhere. I mean, when I first met him, when he was about 16, 17, I met him walking down 125th Street. They actually said I met him before and dissed him, <laughs> you know. His um, cousin reported to me about a couple of weeks ago that mm. I met him before and probably ain't hear him out then. But I bumped into him again and somebody else introduced me to him. And you know, I was telling him, well, you know, give my manager a call and nah, nah, just hear him. Just hear him. All, all we just want to do, mm -hmm. just give mm -hmm. us five minutes to hear him. And I gave him the five minutes and five minutes lasted until 1998, you Word. know. Mind blowing because him to be 16 or 17 when I met him, possessed the, 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 the quality and the potential and the lyrical skills that he had. I was blown away. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, hell sound like you and L, he raps just like you, but I never seen it like that. Mm -hmm. I just seen it as he had raw talent to be a kid that was 16, 17 years old to say the things he was saying. Or even if you was listening, if you was listening to the things um he said on the first remix with me and Yes You May remix back in 1992. Everywhere that I go, brothers know my fucking name. I'm flooring niggas in the only way of bucking chains. Gave a lot of black eyes in my starting days, fucking with me. A lot of niggas were sporting shades. And, and a kid saying this at 16 years old, <laughs> you going. I mean, before the Jay-Z era, before the Nas, before the, the Wu-Tang era, before all the eras that elevated hip-hop to where it is now, the hear kid saying that in 92 mm -hmm. was mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. L. You can't beat me, that's the stone truth. Trying to battle me is like fighting a gorilla in the phone booth. You know, he was just always, he always had something slick out of his mouth mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it hit me because I thought I had slick shit out of my <laughs> mouth to say. The head kid younger than me saying right. stuff that's just as slick as me. I had to give dogs his props and I had to find a place for him along the line on the, mm -hmm. long, on the roster because mm -hmm. he was just crazy. I put him on a show, put him on the phone with show and show was like, yo, this kid is nice, you mm -hmm. know? So we worked with him. I mean, it took a little while. I mean, some people look at it, he just got on, but he didn't. He just, he didn't get on. It took a little while for him to build his reputation. Mm -hmm. And when he was finally signed to Columbia, and you know, uh, first album on Columbia was Lifestyles of Porn Dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I think lyrically he had it, but I, I don't think Columbia had the marketing mm -hmm. strategy that it took to really build them, shape them, mold them, and take them to the level he truly deserved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, because L was there before Nas, and then Nas yeah. came out, and it kind of overshadowed what L was doing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's like they hopped on the Nas, oh, L Matic, and you know, so he kind of got left in the shadow, mm -hmm. you know, but the real underground has no mm -hmm. L was nice. I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. that was incredible. Even the, the recent single Ebonics that he did was done three years ago, mm -hmm. three to four years ago. Mm -hmm. What he did was he had a verse, he said the verse, okay, I got to find other slang words and this and that. And the next time he had another verse. And he held a certain songs he held on to. Right. Yo, when my new album come, I'ma blow, I'ma blow the world with this new stuff I'ma come with. And just hearing his hearing Ebonics and hearing how he laid it down, mm -hmm. told you where he was getting ready to go with mm -hmm. it. Told you so much where he was getting ready to go with it. I mean Jay and Dane was getting ready to sign him right, to Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. You know, but L had his independent singles that he was working, that he was getting money from, and he was 
I mean, to see Al and Bill with him, and, and in the last day, I was Bill with him about a day or two before he got shot. His ideas and 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 the the route he was going and where he was about to take it would have took. I think he knew he knew everything he wanted to do. I think he finally made up his mind. He knew how whatever he was getting ready to do, he knew he had the plan. He explained it to me in the car. And to see him grow from 16 to the age he was, I was just, I couldn't be nothing but proud of him, you know? Mm -hmm. To see that his business sense was sharpening and a lot of moves that he was making was on point and he was ready to take over the world. You know? Where were you, in fact? How did you find out about Elle's murder? Well, where I was at when I found out about Elle's murder is I was coming home from somewhere and it's like as soon as I walked in the door, I think I was coming in from outside, I don't know where I was coming from, but I know as soon as I walked in the door, you know, my girl handed me the phone and said, you got a phone call. She ain't know. She, you know, and it's like, Al got killed. And I'm like, nah, man, you playing. Stop playing. You shouldn't play like that, you know. Nah, it's for real. And, and the way this person sounded on the phone, and then at the same time, my beeper just went through the roof. Right. It just, I mean, it was just vibrating and just going off. And that I kind of sensed that it was real. My beeper never goes off like that. And, you know, they told me he was he was still there at the scene. He was still lying there at the scene. And I know me, Fat Joe, and Sho met up over there at the scene. And, um... It was just shocking to see his body lying there and covered, you know. I mean, I don't know. I can't even describe what type of feeling I was feeling. It was just like, this can't be real. This this, this can't be happening right now. This, this is just crazy right now. I mean, you know, I was just praying that I was going to wake up and it was going to be a dream and I was going to have a cold sweat, but... You know, it, it, it was just crazy. I mean, I can't, I can't because out of all people in around I me mean, and my clip that I know in my circumference, that was the last person you would ever think that would happen to right. because of his demeanor, because of his persona, how he carries himself, real quiet. If he don't know you, he's gonna keep quiet. So he wasn't like the type to start trouble, so, just that whole thing was just, just real. To me, I'm still just, it still fucks me up because to know, to know he was right there and to know everything was about to happen for him. Were you surprised to find out that Big L's assailant was someone from his own block in Harlem? No, not at all. Why? Not knowing Harlem. Mm -hmm. Harlem, it's just like that. It's just. Harlem, I used to, I used to gamble with, with, with L in the gambling hall to, me and him gambling to the wee hours, five, six in the morning shooting dice. He done took maybe three grand, I done maybe took 3,500, we just gambling, but we know when we got this money, it's like, when I, when I'm gambling, I still gamble, but when I'm gambling and my, my figures is exceeding over three to four grand, I'm tapping my man to warm up the car, you know what I'm saying? Anybody with street with street instincts know that when you're getting a certain type of money and a certain type of certain type of effect on people, it's like you gotta be careful no matter if it's Manhattan, no matter if it's Brooklyn, Queens, Yonkers, you gotta watch yourself. I mean you can be the coolest person in the world, mm -hmm. but when you have certain things of value that people don't have you're a target wherever you go. Mm -hmm. So, and, and being in Manhattan, this happens every day. It's not just only out. It happens every day. I mean, and a lot of it is, is setups. I mean, mm -hmm. setups. It's like, okay, we know where he gonna be at. We know when he's going there. We know where he live at. We know where he keeps his money at. Mm -hmm. I'm broke as hell. Why mm -hmm. not?
Now, hip hop is, is has lost a lot of rappers to, you know, this sort of violence from Biggie and Tupac to Freaky Ta, Big L, the most recent shooting with 50 Cent. Why are we seeing more and more artists being victimized and targeted in this way? People take this rap shit too serious. Point blank, they gotta just know how to draw a line with it. I mean, the artists as well as the consumers and the fans gotta know when to draw a line with this mm -hmm. shit. I mean, all that shit you see in here ain't always real. You, you know, people just take it too serious. Especially the street. The street takes it to the extreme. I mean, it always just happens, guns happen to fall in the wrong hands, but... Right. I mean, they should teach, I think they should have a, a class in school to teach children more about guns and how to, how to, you know, protect yourself from guns, whether, mm -hmm. whether if you stumble across a gun in your parent's house, you know, what to do and what not to do, you know, rather than to try to ban guns all together, because you're not going to ban right. guns. Mm -hmm. You might ban them from us in the urban communities, right. but shit, if... If, if somebody else, if you're going to ban guns, ban the shits all together. But I just think people take rap too, too, too serious. Not a, even media, you know. The media is always aching. Always aching to just view, to just, to just film in on rap, you know. Mm -hmm. Any little thing happen. You know, they always waiting there with a camera crew. Mm -hmm. Always waiting. Oh, this rapper slapped his girlfriend. Oh, we got to go to address so-and-so <laughs> right, and get the info. Right, right. I mean, and you might not never heard nothing else from this rapper. When this rapper does a million positive things, this rapper might not be known, might not be gold or platinum, but he do that one negative thing <laughs> that kind of is kind of out there. It's mm -hmm. like all this exposure comes in now. Right, right. But when artists do positive things, why the media ain't there? I mean, mm -hmm. Fat Joe do a positive, he do a million positive things. I mean, all types of things. And I feel, I, I feel men on Fat Joe. I, why I'm saying Fat Joe is because they look at Fat Joe the gangster. Mm -hmm. And you might hear bad things about him. But I don't think people hear the good things he does, you mm -hmm. know? And, and it's wrong. I think you got to hear both sides of the story. I mean, once a rapper does one bad thing, they going in your past. They digging on your police okay, reports. Right. They digging on your motherfucking report cards. <laughs> I, I throw basket. I, me and Fat Joe, we get together every summer. We do this basketball tournament up in the Bronx where we used to live at. Every summer. No film crews. No nothing. I mean, a lot of money, a lot of proceeds should go to the far center, the community center. Mm -hmm. That's right there in the hood. So what what do you think um, folks like yourself like that are part of the hip hop community can do? Um, and maybe this is a way that we can begin talking about the work that you're doing with the basketball teams. But what can be done to help curtail exactly that violence and, doing. you know, um, what am I? What I'm doing right now is I hold the basketball tournament called Urban Extraordinaires. It's a basketball tournament, and it's easier to create a realm around basketball because a lot of people like basketball, whether you're young and old. And it's called Urban Extraordinaires, meaning urban, meaning the community around me, and extraordinaires is meaning as I'm going to urban communities trying to look for kids with that extraordinary talent, meaning mm -hmm. basketball, softball, music or whatever and just try to really gather them up and try to get them out there and also use a lot of money from the proceeds to to donate it to to different not only to my community center but different type charities that are worth donating that money to in order to show kids a better life because kids don't i think in actuality if kids get to go places and see more different things and rather than the bad things they see in the neighborhood, take them to places like Bear Mountain, Rockland State Park, take them out of town, take them to different things and show them better things. Mm -hmm. I think the expectations of themselves would be so much on a higher level, they won't want to go hang on a corner and drink a 40 because they looking at it like, yo, I went here, I went here, these kids, yo, it's cool. I don't, I don't want to hang around a block today. I want to go somewhere else. This block mm -hmm. is boring. <laughs> but if they don't see those things, their expectation levels is never going to exceed that where they're going to want more for themselves. Mm -hmm.